Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Bhavayayesha Sarvenham. Lokava Loka Bhavanaha. Ilavatara. Nurato Devatiryam Naradisu. Translation. The Lord of the universes maintains all planets inhabited by demigods, men and lower animals. Assuming the role of incarnations, he performs pastimes to reclaim those in the mode of pure goodness. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Let me get a minute here. There are innumerable material universes, and in each and every universe, there are innumerable planets inhabited by different grades of living entities and different modes of nature. The Lord, Vishnu, incarnates himself in each and every one of them, and in each and every type of living society. He manifests his transcendental pastimes among them just to create the desire to go back to Godhead. The Lord does not change his original transcendental position, but he appears to be differently manifested according to the particular time, circumstances, and society. Sometimes he incarnates himself or empowers a super suitable living being to act for him, but in either case, the purpose is the same. The Lord wants the suffering living entities to go back home, back to Godhead. The happiness which the living beings are hankering for is not to be found within any corner of the innumerable universes and material planets. Eternal happiness which the living being wants is obtainable in the kingdom of God, but the forgetful living beings under the influence of material modes have no information of the kingdom of God. The Lord therefore comes to propagate the message of the kingdom of God either personally as an incarnation or through his bona fide representative as the good son of God. Such incarnations or sons of God are not making propaganda for going back to God only within the human society. This work is going on in all types of society amongst demigods and those other than human beings. Thus ends Bhaktivedanta Purports, first canto, second chapter, Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Divinity and Divine Service. Om Akyan Timirandasya Kinajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhaktivedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gorgani Pracharine, Nirvishesa Sunyavadi, Pastyatya De Satarine, Panchakalpa, Turubhischa, Kripa Sindhu, Bevacha, Patitanam Pavane, Bio, Vaishnave, Bio, Namaho, Namaha, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadad, Har, Sivasadi, Gor, Vaknarinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So this final verse in this chapter is really a manifestation in terms of the explanation of uh, the mercy of the Lord and how, how, how much that mercy extends itself. Um, in the sense that the Lord, it says he incarnates <clears throat> in the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord comes. He comes in his personal form. And then it says here also, he comes according to time, place, and circumstance. And he manifests a form that is appropriate for the work needed to be done. Just like when he wanted to please the demigods um, in order to bring back their control of the universe after Bali Maharaj had stolen everything, he manifests himself in the form 
first he came out as the four-handed Vishnu form from the womb of Aditi. But then within a few moments, he changed his form into a brahmachari, a small little boy. And then he was decorated with all the paraphernalia of a brahmachari by the great souls. But his manifestation was appropriate because he had to do the work of begging from Bali Maharaj in order to get back the control of the demigods away from the demons. So we see this is a particular uh, intelligence by the Lord seeing the situation and he applies what is needed. And then of course, uh, sometimes he comes in his personal form as Krishna, sometimes in his Vishnu form, sometimes is a manifestation of the mercy of the Lord in the form of the pure devotee spiritual master. He also comes as the, uh, what is called the Shaktivesh avatar, empowered personality that has a particular mission such as Parasaram. And we also may also put Srila Prabhupada in that category also. So you'll see the Lord not only comes, but he uses his intelligence to see the situation and what will be the appropriate manifestation of his incarnation. But the purpose is the same, as is mentioned in the purport, and that is to reclaim the fallen souls and bring them back to the spiritual world. The living entity has a strong desire to become happy. In fact, that is the most prominent a characteristic of the living being is to become happy or to enjoy ha enjoy various types of pleasure. And because that is that propensity is so strong, um, and being in the material tabernacle or the material energy, we the tendency is to try to find it within the purview of our existence. It's not to be condemned, but it's wrong. <laughs> That's the point. The thing is, there is the happiness we are looking for cannot be found in something that is temporary and something that is subjected ultimately to the opposite, some form of suffering. So, but because the propensity is so strong to become happy, the living entity in their situation, they're always looking for happiness. And sometimes they fail to understand where real happiness is more, they easily are led by the external environment. So in order to uh, curtail that and to bring the consciousness back to the proper understanding, what is my ultimate benefit? My ultimate benefit is according to my nature, and my nature is not material. I accept the body, but I am not the body. Uh, I am within the body, and the body has uh, activities, but I, I am aloof from all these activities and what we might say uh, wrong desires. So this particular purport is really a manifestation of and an explanation of the Lord's supreme mercy. Because not only does he come in human society, as it's mentioned here, he comes in the, all the societies. Uh, in another place, in the Bhagavatam, it mentions, I think it's also, I think it's in the seventh canto. I can't remember the exact reference, but it says that there are 8,400,000 species of life and the Lord incarnates in all 400,000 species of life. In other words, he becomes the best within the species, which attracts the species to him, and because those living entities in that species are attracted to him, they, uh, they what we say, are accelerated on the path towards human life. In other words, they get a chance to move fast through the evolutionary process. 
Otherwise, according to the system set up by material energy, one has to go from one type of body to another, uh, constantly receiving bodies and losing bodies and getting more bodies. But the Lord feels sorry for the living entity who is suffering in this material world. The Lord knows us better than we know ourselves because he knows everything. And he's also localized within the heart of all living entities. So he is there watching us, understanding us, and clearly knowing what is our desires. So he, therefore, he, is, uh, he has manifested himself in that form to show supreme mercy. And then when he wants to even show greater mercy, he manifests himself personally in an incarnation or he empowers him uh, an incarnation to come on, on his behalf, the pure devotee, uh, spiritual master, who does the work of the Lord simply to please the Lord and to raise the conditioned souls back to the spiritual world. So we can learn from this particular verse how merciful Krishna is and how tirelessly he uh, is endeavoring to rescue the living entity in their foolishness to try to enjoy the material world. Prabhupada makes a little, kind of a little cute little statement. He says, there's no, even in the most remote corners of this universe, you can't find happiness. In other words, wherever you're looking, you're not going to find it. And this is the nature of the material world. Um, as Krishna emphasizes, not only speaks, but emphasizes in the Bhagavad Gita, the Dukalayam Masasratam, uh, Anitya Masubam. Um, he says it at least two or three times that this place is temporary and it is miserable and no one can stay here and no one can find the satisfaction they're looking for here unless of course they take up devotional service which is not part of the material energy which is situated on the platform of paraprakriti or transcendental energy of the lord which uh, appears in the material world as the as the manifestation of the Lord's mercy in the form of the process of bhakti yoga, pure devotional service. Then the activities that the living entity performs are no longer within the three modes of material nature. They are divyam, transcendental. As the Lord is divyam, the living entity performing devotional service takes on the same quality. And as Srila Prabhupada says, when you're engaged in devotional service, you are on the liberated platform. You have nothing, although you may still have a body and still have activities in this material world, still you are, what we say, not entrapped by the uh, three modes of material nature. And that is the power of devotional service. It lifts one out of this, this entanglement of... Um, the struggle to find happiness within the area of the three modes of material nature. So, uh, a devoted, and this principle is fundamental for achieving success. And what is, uh, what is that principle? That one has to be convinced, not just theoretically, but within their mind and heart, absolutely, that there is no happiness in the material world. <clears throat> Sometimes it is said that there is a statement that's given by uh, Chandidas, I think it is one of the Vaishnav poets. He says, if there's any happiness in the material world, it's society, friendship, and love. In other words, what is that happiness, that happiness of family life? which he compares to a drop of water in a desert. Using that analogy, we understand that the water is not found in the desert. And those who find themselves in a desert are usually looking for water or in need of water. And so if someone comes along and gives you a drop, you might actually become upset because it doesn't really satisfy you and it only inspires you in your, in your thirst. 
and only increases your thirst. <clears throat> so, um, therefore, a devotee who's in knowledge understands why waste time. This is the important part. Wasting time trying to find something that doesn't exist. But this is the nature of the living entity. There's a little bit of a story. It's not a story. It's a little, what we say, in you, a little uh, innuendo or a little message story. One man, he's looking for, he's looking on the ground and he keeps looking, 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 looking. And along comes his friend and he says, well, what are you looking for? He said, I've lost some money. Well, he said, oh, well, I'll help you look. So both are looking and then the friend realizes, it's not, he says, are you sure? He tells him, turns to him, are you sure you lost the money here? He said, and the man says, no, I lost it over there, but it's, there's more light here. So that's the, uh, that's the living entity. They think because I can perceive according to my uh, senses that this object will give me pleasure. Therefore, this, I'm, uh, I'm convinced that this will happen. So the pleasure exists uh, within our own heart. We don't have to look for pleasure outside. Pleasure exists within the heart because the Lord is within the heart. And the heart is the, is the seat of the soul. The soul sits on the heart. So on the heart, the soul is Satchit Ananda. And therefore, that pleasure is existing within the soul automatically. So looking for pleasure outside uh, will never bring that satisfaction. We can find pleasure on the outside when we first find it on the inside or within ourselves. Therefore, one of the qualities of a devotee is he's around, self-satisfied, uh, not looking for the external environment to give him pleasure. Devotees can chant anytime, read anytime, and perform services in different ways at any time. So there's where the, where's the internal happiness starts to awaken because as we connect with the spiritual energy through devotional service, that happiness, which is within us, starts to become connected, or that nature within us can starts to connect with this with Krishna's nature, or the internal spiritual nature. And when we connect, then we can find satisfaction and happiness. It's just like if you're in a room, and uh, in the room there is a fireplace in one corner of the room. But if you're in the opposite corner, so you may not be able to feel the heat. But as you go closer to the fire, although you're not completely near the fire, as you go closer, the heat starts to increase. So as we go closer to Krishna, through the process of devotional service, uh, happiness, knowledge, and freedom from suffering, these are the three characteristics as mentioned, develop automatically. And then the, the analogy is used in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the 11th canto, just like eating. When you're hungry, you eat. And the eating process does three things. It gives pleasure, it satisfies the hunger, and it gives uh, energy and resources to the body. So in the same way, knowledge, happiness, and detachment uh, all occur automatically as a devotee engages in devotional service. And of course, the uh, recommended process of devotional service, which is the essence of devotional service, is to glorify the Lord by hearing his glories and by chanting his glories. And taking those glories and also using it as an opportunity to reach others. There's another meaning to this particular purport where it is says we can see how enthusiastic and how determined the Lord is to reach the conditioned souls who are suffering in the material world. 
So we might say one of the best services that we can, one can do is to assist the Lord in his mission. So those who uh, see that, yes, the Lord is uh, endeavoring in so many ways to give Krishna consciousness to the living entities throughout the universe, let me assist him. So by doing that, and by becoming engaged in that particular service, as Prabhupada said, one gets noted, noted, noticed by the Lord. He says, as soon as you begin the, oper the activities of trying to reach the conditioned souls, automatically you know, Krishna notices you. And in other words, he, he, he puts his glance upon you. And if you're glanced upon by the Lord, if you're noticed by the Lord, then, as Prabhupada said, your life has reached perfection or success. Okay, these are some things we can think about in terms of our uh, the Lord's mercy, how he manifests that mercy, how enthusiastic he manifests that mercy, how widespread that mercy comes. It's amazing when you read purports like this, you really understand uh, how kind Krishna is and how much he feels for the suffering of the living entities. And the other point is, of course, that uh, devotees want to please the Lord by assisting the Lord in his mission. Okay, so we can stop here and see if there's any comments or questions. Thank you, Mamaj, for the wonderful class and the wonderful points. Uh, we, op we ask devotees if you have any questions, comments, or um, reflections, realizations, please uh, do share. Um, you can even post in the chat if you want, but you are very well free to unmute yourself and make your comments or questions. I'm trying to see if there are any questions here, Marge. Okay. I okay, that was not a question. Marge, you mentioned, um, I can ask a question, Marge. You mentioned um, three points that you were referring to from this uh, poet, Chandidas, so Society, Friendship, and Love. Um, knowing that society, friendship, and love is there, but it's also limited, you know, it's not like it's, uh, um, it, it can go both ways, attachment or detachment. So how can a devotee still appreciate society, friendship, and love and not be attached? <laughs> <laughs> it, it can go both ways. <laughs> well... The relationships we have with these categories have to be spiritualized. And the understanding of, the, of our relationship with the, the individuals who are in that, that relationship is one of service. So when we try to serve our family members, when we serve, serve others by serving the Lord or serving them, through serving the Lord, then um, the detachment is only necessary on the material level. Spiritually, we are attached to uh, performing activities that uplift our consciousness and, and please Krishna. So, so for, like just for say for say for uh, within a family, so. If everyone is working uh, according to their service in relationship to each other and at the same time practicing spiritual life, then that family is not material, it's spiritual. Prabhupada said it's good as Vaikuntha. Uh, we want to make the society Krishna conscious too, but then you need leaders who are actually have that spiritual acumen where they can lead society. 
So everything has to have a foundation in the, in the qualities and the knowledge that is of at least the mode of goodness. Within the mode of goodness, the characteristics that are foundational for practicing spiritual life, such as knowledge, uh, happiness, and uh, charity, various types, are conducive to developing spiritual relationships. The modes of passion and ignorance are not. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj, for clarifying that point. I was having the thought when you mentioned it. There is a question from two devotees. I'm going to go to Sri Devi first, because she had her hand up. Sri Devi, you can unmute yourself and ask a question, Prabhu. Thank you, Anasuya. Please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Maharaj, and all the assembled Vaishnavas. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Your Holiness. Uh, Guru Maharaj, in the lecture, you mentioned that Krishna incarnates in all the species of life. So let's say we have earthworms, cockroaches, fish, reptiles everywhere, and Krishna is there incarnated in, as himself in that particular form. But the consciousness of those living entities is very low. How will they be attracted to Krishna and begin devotional service or go back to Godhead? He's, be he's the best one in the species. And he becomes like a magnet to the other ones. That's how it's described. He's the best glow worm. He's the best cockroach. <laughs> That's why we don't so kill any. No, we don't kill anything. <laughs> right. And so that means those living entities get attracted to Krishna and they end the, uh, instead of going on to the, through the evolutionary cycle, they go back to God and simply by their attraction to him? Mm, they get promoted on the evolutionary scale. We, there's no devotional service there. It's just the attraction which pushes them forward on the evolutionary scale. And how, how far forward, that's not mentioned. But that's up to Krishna, depending on the situation. Okay. Thank you so much for clarifying that, Guru Maharaj. Appreciate it very much. It's in, the, it's in point to understand how merciful Krishna is, that he would take the trouble in coming in these other species. Marsh, there's a question in the chat that says, Har Krishna, dear Gurudev, thank you so much for the great inspiration. Is that truth that if Krishna manifests our wishes, is that arrangement by Maya or his external energy? How, or how do we understand it for your great inspiration? Or does that mean that Krishna is pleased if he fulfills our wishes? Well, depends, you know, Krishna... You're talking about spiritual wishes or material wishes. Wishes means I want something and I'm hoping I can get it. So we might offer some prayers to Krishna. It might be like, I want a new house. I want to find a husband or a wife. I want to get a job. Um, Krishna doesn't really get involved with these things. Um, generally, as you, as Prabhupada mentions in the, uh, it's in the seventh canto, yeah. He says, uh, as you engage in devotional service, Krishna automatically uh, fulfills your needs on the material level also. He gives you the facilities, he gives you the intelligence. So, and sometimes he directly fulfills these. These are just Krishna's, Krishna's ways to reciprocate. So don't waste time with all these wishes. <laughs> And just keep your consciousness focused on that activity, which will bring you success in all areas, and that's devotional service. Unless we need something material for our devotional service, then we may ask the Lord, but if he doesn't give, then we, it doesn't change our relationship. We just continue on in our devotional service. March, another question here is, uh, yesterday you mentioned that it's good to sing the Bhajan Jaya Nila Premadana. We read the translation and I got a question. 
Could you tell me about the background pastimes, how the bhajan was created? Um, hmm. Well, that's Naratam Das Thakur, yeah. It's, it's connected with the life of Naratam Das Thakur. I think when Srinivasacharya or Ramachandra Kaviraj, either one, uh, disappeared because Srinivasacharya was very, very close to Naratam and also um, uh, Ramachandra Kaviraj and Kanavatam Das Thakur. Um, he, even, he even sings it in, a, in the other songs. We sing that um, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, uh, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Doya Kora Mohore. And then the last line, Haha Prabhu Srinivasa, Haha Prabhu Acharya, was it? How's that last line go? Ha ha Prabhu Srinivasa uh, Ramachandra Sangha Mage Naro Tamadas. So he sings about Srini, Srinivasa Charya and Narottam and, uh, and uh, Ramachandra Kariraj in the mood of separation. So I'm sure it's, it was related to their disappearance. And our time created that song. Are there, you're opening up a question. So if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself. You can raise your hand on that chat if you want, but you can just jump in and unmute yourself too. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. Our glories to Srila Prabhupada and our glories to you. Uh, and Guru Maharaj, you spoke about uh, happiness. And uh, I thought I, underst I already understood this topic, but, <laughs> but I realized that I re really don't. Because uh, I understand that uh, material, so-called material happiness is, is temporary. So this is quite clear. But... Um, uh, to understand that it's not real happiness uh, is, is a bit difficult for me because, uh, for example, when I, I take prasadam or, or uh, taking uh, that, Buddha, that's, not, that's, that's, that's not taking prasadam is spiritual. I understand, but uh, I don't feel the difference between uh, taking boga or prasadam. I mean, obviously, I want to avoid boga, but... Uh, but the, the feeling is the same for me. Then you're really not aware of, uh, of what is the difference because for those in Krishna consciousness, generally they would, just the idea of taking boga would cause them some dissatisfaction immediately. I, I have idea. this intellectually, but um, I mean, the senses uh, perceive the same. Yeah, well, then, you're, then your senses are covering your intelligence. Mm. Uh. And material happiness is, there's a word that's called oxymoron. You know what that means? Uh, I, I don't think so. Oxymoron means two things that don't go together. Mm such as uh, an honest businessman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something like that, or a small crowd. <laughs> uh, so two things that don't go together, and when you put them together, that's called an oxymoron. So therefore, material happiness is an oxymoron. Because mm -hmm. uh, Krishna says, I mean, he says it many times, there's no happiness here. He doesn't say there is some, he says there's none. And then again, you have to define what is happiness. If you think happiness is a relief from suffering, then, then that will be, that's wrong. 
but that's what goes on is material happiness. You're suffering, so you get some relief and you call that happiness. That's not happiness. That's just mm -hmm. a relief from the miseries that you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada uses the definition or the example. They would take a person who was a criminal and bring him down to the uh, river and walk into the river about waist deep and then take his head and push it under water and leave it there until he was about to die and then they would pull it up and then he would take a breath of air and think, oh, so nice. And that's material life. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I think, uh, yeah, probably my, I, I have to uh, purify my senses and uh, it will be uh, easier to understand at that point. Uh, yeah, right now. Is... Just take Prashad, don't eat both. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do that. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. That was a nice question. Thank you, Marish, for actually, I, I think that's the first time that I'm hearing the word oxymoron. I've never heard that term before, <laughs> so I learned something new today. Yeah, it's, a, it's a term that's not often used, but it has a clear definition. It's just two things that don't go together. Sometimes we even joke and extend it a little bit farther. Sometimes we say happy marriage. <laughs> 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 That's a nice one, Marge. <laughs> Are there any um, questions or comments? I'm trying to see if there's anything in the chat. Uh, okay, turn to... I'm seeing Pariksha, but I'm not hearing him. Very well, very well. I don't have a question, but I'm really appreciating the lecture very much. And um, I had yeah, been... your volume is a little low. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay. Um, okay, probably it should be better now. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm really appreciating everything that you you preach, as I always do in all your lectures. Um, but I don't have any questions. I'm just basically. Um, really enjoyed how you handled this uh, idea of someone eating burger versus prashadam and not feeling any difference. Uh, <laughs> it was so much to learn from there. Um, sometimes people buy uh, uh, stuff from uh, stores, packaged things, and yes, they do um, qualify in that, you know, there's no things that Krishna says we shouldn't eat in it, so then it's okay, like a bag of peanuts or something, you know, but then it wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't fried and made under the conditions like what you would get in the, in the temple. Maybe peanuts is not a good uh, example, but something like that, people just take it and then what yeah. do you do? It's just, it's just our consciousness. Mm -hmm. One who is accustomed to accepting prasadam will feel unhappy if they're eating something that is not. Mm. Or they'll feel a little bit less happy. Mm. Or they'll feel a little guilty. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. It's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I've seen uh, devotees, supposing they have to take something like that, they just uh, hold it in their hands, close their eyes, and they say, Shri Vishnu, Shri Vishnu, Shri Vishnu, and mentally offer it like that to Krishna before eating it. Is that good enough? Uh, you could talk about emergency situations where you might be out traveling and you don't have any facility to offer anything. But it doesn't take long to say the prayers. There's only three prayers chanted three times. It takes maybe two minutes not even two minutes. So best is to carry our own prasadam when traveling, right? Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments, uh, reflections, realizations? Uh, please do unmute yourself and you can just unmute and jump in. You don't have to raise your hand if, if you can't. I don't see any, okay. I just don't want to miss anybody because we have 30, almost 35 participants online. Marsh, that does not seem to have any questions, but you, you do have about 10, 15 minutes, Marsh, if you want to add more or. Um, let's see. Um, well, is there anything in specific you would like to me to address? Any topic? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Haribo. Please accept my humble obeisance. He's all glorious to Srila Prabhupada. Um, the other day we were speaking on, um, as devotees, we use suffering as a tool for advice, for realization. Lessons learned, lessons cause us to mature. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak more on suffering, um, kind of in relation to like the three modes of nature, like how suffering brought on by others can you know, be a tool for our salvation, things like that. <laughs> our suffering coming from the outside is an opportunity for spiritual growth? Is yes. Yes. Well, yes. yeah, there is, it's mentioned that their suffering comes in three forms, <clears throat> adiatmic, body and mind, adivaltic, uh, other living entities, and Adidaivik from higher powers, which is using the demigods in weather conditions. The coronavirus is Adidaivik coming from, I mean, from outside of the, the, the realm of, you know, an individual, but it's coming from the, the, the material nature. So uh, these things are, these are called kleshas or miseries, and they're very much inherent in the material world. So when we feel the, uh, the brunt of some kind of material suffering, uh, there's different ways to, to process that, depending on what's coming and how it's coming. There's one way we can take it as an opportunity uh, to learn something, to get purified from some material attachment, but most important to take shelter of Krishna. Suffering is an impetus for greater, greater devotion, greater uh, dependence on Krishna. So, yeah, everything in the material world can be used to bring us closer to Krishna. Either happiness that we feel or some kind of pleasure we might experience. We can thank Krishna for that. When, when we get some suffering, we can turn to Krishna and uh, ask Krishna, what can we learn from this? How can we grow from this? How can I, uh, you know, take shelter of you and be freed from the effects. So, and of course, there's another completely other category that um, this is one verse from the 10th Canto, the 14th chapter, verse number eight, where Lord Brahma says, Tate nukam pam shikshamikshamanam puja neva kritam vipakam Ridva Vahubir Vididan Namaste Jiveti Yo Mukti Padesha Dayabak. Srila Prabhupada put a lot of emphasis on this verse at different times. It's a very profound and very uh, important verse. And it is that the devotee who, who's undergoing suffering uh, sees it as the mercy of the Lord in order to purify them. And uh, they don't reject it, they accept it as the Lord's mercy. And not only that, but they thank the Lord 
saying that the suffering that I'm getting uh, should have been much worse than it is, but because of your kindness, you're only giving me a small token. One who prays like that, and then the last line in the verse, Mukti Padesha Dayabak, uh, that person is eligible for going back home, back to Godhead. <clears throat> so that's an interesting point that devotees should keep in mind because it's fundamental to our practice in Krishna consciousness. That sometimes that the, the suffering is coming by way of Krishna directly to uh, bring us closer to him. And sometimes it's coming indirectly through the external energy. In either case, we could grow from it. Marsh, there's a question in the chat that says, my question, Dhanvar Pranam to Shri Prabhupada and to you, Maharaj. My question is how to identify a person's aggression, whether it is sattvic aggression or rajasic or tamasic, and how to absorb is, and how to, to absorb is it according to the mood? <laughs> Whoa. Um... Well, I'm, I'm assuming that aggression is coming towards you. So uh, there's a verse in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, which talks about suffering coming on from other living entities. It says that if one blames or identifies the object of that, the, of their suffering, uh, they also get a reaction for that. In other words, if someone does something to you and you blame that person, you also get a reaction like they get the reaction for doing it to you. Because what's happening, as Prabhupada used to say, don't be, don't be disturbed by the instrument of your karma. So a lot of times people and circumstances are just giving us what we deserve, that's all. And if you blame the circumstance or them, then you also become implicated in the same reactions. Now that requires a lot of depth of prayer and understanding because the tendency is to blame or see the object of our suffering and then find fault with that. But when we know, just like they say, if you want to change other people, it's easy. Just change yourself. Because as soon as you change, how they relate to you will also change. Marge, this question that you that uh, Namrata just asked is a pretty powerful question. Because um, how does one, um, because it, it doesn't only happen in the material, in, in, in terms with non-devotees or with karmis, but it also happens with devotees. Mm -hmm. You know, but we, we, as much as we know, whatever we, we know of the knowledge that we hear, still we have the tendency, you know, but you did this to me, you did this to me. How can we help ourselves to really see, okay, you know, it's my purification, it's my karma, you know, I'm burning my karma, you know, like, like how can we get to that stage to really learn something from it? Well, I would say you would read that section, Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, um, chapter 17, starting with verse number 23, I believe it's, no, I'm sorry, verse number 16 or 17, 117, 17, I think it is. And read on, and Prabhupada addresses it purport after purport. Uh, and it's in relationship to uh, Maharaj Parikshit uh, stopping the personification of Kali from uh, beating the legs of a bull. <clears throat> he asks the bull, you know, what's the cause of your suffering? And then the bull starts becoming very philosophical and doesn't blame 
the personification of Kali. And then there's a nice dialogue. And in each purport, in each of the verses, Prabhupada brings up some of the possible reasons why suffering occurs. It's quite intricate and it's quite hard to understand. You have to read it and study it. 117, 17, read on to about verse number 24, I think, or 23. Interesting dialogue. It's 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 worth a seminar, that section alone. It's just interesting. And it really comes to the conclusion that uh, um, whatever is happening to you, there's a, there's a reason for it. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. That was very thought-provoking, <laughs> very enlightening. Um, are yeah. there any? <laughs> yeah, that was very deep. <laughs> are there any questions? Or uh, you know, please, do we have a few more minutes. Um, it can be of any topic. Hare Krishna, may I have an, another question connected to this last point? Please, please. Uh, thank you very much. Because um, you spoke about uh, that uh, what happens to us is due to our karma. But uh, for me, it's all the time difficult to understand that sometimes there are these uh, saintly people uh, who all also seem seems to have something which is uh, like karmic reaction. But I, I also can understand that uh, suffering uh, is uh, uh, there due to our mind, uh, that we perceive something as suffering. So Well, suffering can come from different apparent, uh, what we say, agencies. And that's where that dialogue, it mentions all the possible venues by which suffering appears. It's not necessarily only your karma. It might come from Krishna to, just to purify you from some material attachment or some, some wrong mentality. For a devotee, everything is under the hands of the spiritual energy and therefore it's being orchestrated by Krishna. Or it's being allowed by Krishna. The material is, they're suffering is simply due to their activities in the material world because their activities produce suffering. And uh, uh, why is there something uh, like that? For example, uh, Srila Prabhupada also had to have these heart attacks, which probably was, I don't know if it was suffering, probably it was suffering for him. Well, it was a difficulty, and obviously he had to endure the, the pain, but he saw it as Krishna's mercy. And the materialists and the spiritualists don't suffer in the same way. They, they just feel there's some inconvenience being given. And then, of course, their, their real suffering is thinking that whatever's happening to them on the physical level may impair their devotional service. So they become really concerned about that. When Prabhupada had two heart attacks on the boat coming over, it was quite severe. He was meant to, he was meant to leave his body at the time, but Krishna intervened and, and uh, allowed him to continue. So for a transcendental person, they may undergo some apparent suffering, but it's not like the materialists. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see. Thank you very much. It's, uh, actually, it reminds me, I, I remember I read something like uh, uh, devotees asked uh, Srila Prabhupada about uh, um, his, uh, uh, one of uh, uh, his uh, sickness. And uh, he said, uh, I think it was this expression that it was something like a love fight uh, with Krishna. And uh, for me, it was so heartwarming because I could see that uh, how he, he sees even suffering that uh, in, a, in a personal way in, in a, as a relationship with Krishna and, and how different it is uh, from <laughs> my point of view. And, and the, that it can be really, really different. So Yeah, 
because they see everything in related. But there's another point, and that is, as long as you have a material body, you're going to feel, you're going to undergo difficulty. Yep. It's the nature of the material body. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any other questions? We have a couple of more minutes. Any other last minute points? Uh, if I may, Anasuya, I would yes. ask about incarnations in particular, since we are talking about Krishna and different incarnations, how he comes. Is that okay? Please, please. Thank you. Um, Guru Maharaj, on this subject, we were um, discussing a little bit in our Chaitanya Charita Amrit class, and I personally have understood that Krishna is the first expansion, and from him come the first quadruple expansion, Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradyumna, Anirudh. But from that point on, how the second quadruple expansion comes, how the Vaikuntha planets are populated, all that is a bit uh, difficult for me to understand. That's one. And then it's... Oh. If you could understand it, you, you'd be back to the spiritual world. <laughs> really. I mean, Lord Chaitanya, I mean, not Lord Chaitanya, but Jiva Goswami explains that the nature of the Lord's, you know, character and qualities are achintya. It's inconceivable. But the expansions don't go like that. Krishna is the original supreme personality of God and from him Balaram comes from Balaram then the first chapter of Yuha from the first chapter of Yuha the expansions of the Narayan forms come from the Narayans the second chapter of Yuha comes and from the second chapter of Yuha from the from the Sankarsha and the expansion of the second chapter of Yuha begins the manifestation of the Vishnu forms in the form of Maha Vishnu so that's the actual order. But although everything is expanding as it's described, everything is eternal at the same time. So where can we read about this, um, you know, this expansions uh, in detail to understand how the Narayana comes from, from the first quarter? Srimad Bhagavatam. Second canto, a lot of it's there. Uh, second and third canto mostly. Mostly second canto. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rama Samhita also describes it. <laughs> and what is the meaning of this particular line, Guru Maharaj? Outside of the Vaikunda planets is the impersonal manifestation of Sri Krishna, which is known as Brahma Lok. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the Brahma Jyoti. Oh, that's Brahma the Brahma Jyoti. Jyoti. Yeah. Okay, so here Brahma Lok actually means Brahma Jyoti. Yeah. Okay. Because we also have Brahma Lok in the material world, which is the highest planet, right? And that is Brahma Lok. Is that so you're talking about you're talking about Brahman or you're talking about Brahma? Here it just says this one line was a bit confusing for me, for us, uh, in the in the Chaitanya Charita Amrit uh, chapter five of the Adi Leela. Outside of the Vaikunda planets is the impersonal manifestation of Sri Krishna, which is known as Brahma Lok. So we were wondering why this word Brahma Lok is being used because we were till now at least I had only heard of Brahma Lok being in the material world as the highest planet of Lord Brahma. Hmm. Yeah, that requires a little bit further reading in that, in that area to get clarification. I would, the word should be Brahman. Brahman is the impersonal manifestation of the influences of the Lord. Ramalok um, indicates a planet. So it's a little, uh, the wording sometimes is a little, um, which is what we say, uh, it extends itself beyond the apparent meaning and beyond the apparent wording. So what Brahma Lok means in relationship to that would be different than what Brahma Lok is in the material world. Now, 
then you have to research, research it farther within that narration. All right, Guru Maharaj, we'll try and do that. We'll try to research that. Thank you so much for the clarification. Thank you so much. In fact, how was I'm glad you, you asked that question, Sri Devi, because I always had a mental block of how to understand this whole, you know, it to, to me it's like a flow chart and it's hard to understand the step by step level. Thank you for bringing that up. We, we are past the hour, so I don't want to, um, you know, forget anyone if there are any questions or comments. Um, I don't want to miss anyone out. And um, just going to give you like a couple of seconds if you, if you have anything to just jump in and say something. That way I don't offend anybody here by not giving you an opportunity. Okay, I think we're good, Marge. Thank you so much for your time, Marge. As always, <laughs> it is so nice to hear your class. It's so nice to see you. And I'm fortunate that we in Harrisburg can get to see you at least once every two weeks while you're in UK and here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marge. Thank you for giving us your mercy and your guidance. I'm always looking forward to this particular Zoom call. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I'm finding it really inspirational. Thank and you. And I'm also connecting with you guys, so that's nice. <laughs> it's, it's your good mercy, much. It's your mercy and your fortune and your blessings and everything that's giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm also glad that we can get to see you. Yeah. We are yeah. the ones who are most fortunate, Maharaj. <laughs> we are the ones. <laughs> Thank you I, so I, much. Yeah. You, and we thank forward. all the devotees for joining us and we um we thank you again for being part of this wonderful zoom class and we and we are happy that by the mercy of um, his holiness chandramani swami we get to see all the other devotees online even though we can't see your faces that is we got some names down so i really am appreciating that and thank you for uh, being part of this zoom class and we look forward to, to the next class until then, Vanchaka Putabriascha, Kripa Sindhubevacha, Patita Nam, Pavinavya, Vaishnavya, Namo Namaha, Ki Jai. Shri Prabhupada, Ki Jai. His Holiness Chandramani Swami, Ki Jai. Vaishnavya, Ki Jai. Jai, all the glories to the Harrisburg Vaishnavas. Thank you, Maharaj. We need your blessings, Maharaj. <laughs> I'll never forget my visit to Harrisburg. Still etched in my mind. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. Thank you to all the. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Hari Bol.